Hi, this is Kara Tierney from Monroe Community College, and we're going to talk about the combined gas law. Now, the combined gas law comes from the lesson from last video, which was PV equals NRT. That is called the ideal gas equation. Now, when we hold the amount of gas N constant in this ideal gas equation, we end up with our combined gas law. So if our amount of gas is constant, and we know that R, the gas constant, is constant, we know that these two are constant, and what we do is we solve for those two variables. So we're going to divide by t so that our constant, nr, is equal to pv over t. So we know that if pv over t is equal to some value, nr, that is constant, no matter what we do, if I change up v, P, the values of P and T are going to compensate for that so that our entire PV over T is staying the same value. Because of this, we get the combined gas law, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, uh, where all of our values on the left side with the one subscript, this is the initial values of our pressure, volume, and temperature. And then if we change some of those values at the end, our final conditions are on the right side with the subscript of two. So when do you use this equation? This is a question I get a lot of times when students are confused whether to use the ideal gas equation or the combined gas equation. And the hint I have for you, take a look at these two equations. So let's go back, look at the equation at the top and the bottom. What uh, sets them apart? The first thing is the combined gas equation does not have moles incorporated into it. So if you are given moles, you know that you're not going to be using the combined gas equation. Second, if you have a variable that changes values, you know that you're going to be using the combined gas law. So if you have a temperature that changes values, or pressure or volume, if you're given two different values for that variable, you know you're going to be using the combined gas law. Now we can use the combined gas law to derive equations for some of the gas laws that we talked about in class earlier this week. And one of those is Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law is the combined gas law where we also hold temperature constant. And what we get, if we look at our combined gas law, if we hold temperature constant, that means T1 and T2 are equal to each other. So what we can do is just cross those variables out of the equation, and we're left with P1V1 equals P2V2. This is called Boyle's Law. So you can derive Boyle's Law, the equation for Boyle's Law, from the equation for the combined gas law. And so um, I trust that you can do problems that are more simple with the combined gas law where you're given five variables and you solve for the sixth. We're going to do a couple examples where we uh, have to derive another gas law from it. So let's look at problem example four. We have a sample of nitrogen gas in a constant volume container at 25 degrees Celsius, and it has a pressure of 2.50 atmospheres. Determine the temperature in Celsius if the pressure is increased to 4.25 atmospheres. So what I should do first is I determine what each of these values, what the variable is that it stands for. So if we have a temperature, we, and we start off with that temperature, we know that that is T1, so that's our 25 degrees Celsius. And the 2.50, that would be our first pressure. I know I'm using the combined gas law because I see that the pressure changes to be 4.25 atmospheres, which means that we have to solve for our second temperature. And it says determine the temperature. Now see that it says in Celsius. That's going to be key. So we're going to write out our combined gas law. And I know that right away in all gas problems, temperatures need to be expressed in Kelvin. So let's just do that right now. I'm going to convert temperature 1 to Kelvin by adding 273.15. And this is equal to 298 Kelvin. 
Now I bet you're asking me what happened to that 0.15. Because 25 degrees Celsius only goes to the ones place, and we're doing addition where you don't count sig figs, you look at where is the last place of the least precise number, and for 25 degrees Celsius, that's the least precise number, and it goes to the ones, so my answer needs to go to the ones as well. Now we see that T's and P's are covered in our givens, but there's no mention of volume. That means we can assume that volume is constant and we can cross it right out of our equation. So we are left with P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. We need to solve for T2. How I suggest that you do this is get rid of all of your fractions. Fractions can be very confusing even for those of us that are more comfortable with math. How we do that is by cross multiplying. So if, let's rewrite this, just to make sure everybody knows where we're at. Let's cross multiply. So that means P1 T2 is equal to P2 T1. And that's a little bit easier to solve for. We need to solve for T2. So we're going to divide everything by P1. and we get that T2 is equal to P2 T1 over P1. So let's plug those in here. So P2 is 4.25 atmospheres. T1, make sure you plug it in correctly, that's 298 Kelvin. P1 was 2.50 atmospheres atmospheres cancel out. And looks like we need three significant figures. So when you calculate this, you should get 507. And our unit is Kelvin. Make sure you're paying attention to the units because it asks for Celsius, which means we're going to subtract 273.15. But because our 507 only goes to the ones place, we're going to round our answer to the ones place, and you should get 234 degrees Celsius. Now, if you got 233, that means you probably didn't round at 507, and that's okay. Uh, we can vary in our last digit, and that's perfectly acceptable in the scientific world. So what I want you to do is try problem example five. See if you can get a good start on this. It's very similar to the last one we just did. And see how far you get. Press pause as you're doing this, and then press play when you think you have an answer or if you get stuck, and I'll show you how to do it. So we're going to do very much the same thing. We're going to determine what variables are given to us. It looks like we have two temperatures. That means temperature one is 35.1 degrees Celsius. Volume 1 is 1.00 liter. Temperature 2 is 25.6 degrees Celsius. And it looks like we're solving for volume 2. Okay, so first thing we should do, let's take care of our temperatures. So, temperature 1 Let's add 273.15 to that. Same with temperature 2. Remember that we need to take into account our significant figures. Both of our temperatures were given to the tenths place, so we are going to round our answer to one digit after that decimal to the tenths place. So our first temperature is going to be 308.3 Kelvin. And our second temperature is 298.8 Kelvin. Now, here is our equation. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. What are we going to do with this? It looks like our pressure is going to be constant because there's no mention of it. So cancel out the pressures and we're left with V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. What are we going to do to get rid of those fractions? Cross multiply. We are given then 
V1 T2 equals V2 T1. We're going to solve for V2, which means we need to divide both sides by T1. Cross out those T1s. So we have V2 is equal to V1 T2 over T1. That's 1.00 liters times, make sure you get the right temperature, V1 T2. So that means it's the 298.8 Kelvin. And that is divided by 308.3 Kelvin. Our Kelvins cancel out. And we, uh, let's see how many sig figs. Three significant figures that gives us 0.9. Six nine liters. Now, does that make sense? Our temperature goes down. That means that our particles are moving a little bit slower. They're not going to take up quite as much room, so we should get a lower volume, which we did get a smaller volume, so that makes sense. So in our next video, we're going to mix up the ideal equation just a little bit more, and uh, I will see you in that video.